Is there a right to humanitarian intervention? The question poses two central issues. Is it legitimate, in the sense of lawful under international law, to use force in the internal affairs of a country without that country's consent to avert a humanitarian disaster? And if it is legitimate, then in what circumstances can the use of force be so justified? In particular, who, what body, can authorise the use of force to avert a humanitarian disaster. The horrific and visible consequences of failing to take the opportunity on some occasions has forced the international community to acknowledge that there are occasions when the deployment of military force for human protection is legitimate and can be authorised by international law. There is a right for the populations who face massacre or ethnic cleansing to expect protection from the international community if their own government either will not provide the protection or are the perpetrators of the assaults themselves. To pose the question, would it have been unlawful to use force to prevent the Rwandan genocide, reveals the absurdity of the answer, yes, it would have been unlawful. And the international community have accepted that. But humanitarian intervention raises the conflict between the right of a state to treat its sovereignty as inviolable by other countries and the conflicting obligation of the sovereign state to protect its individual members of its population to protect their human rights. The international community's doubts about humanitarian intervention spring from that conflict and from an international order which had no real room for humanitarian intervention during the Cold War, and from a legitimate fear that the right to humanitarian intervention can turn from the unquestionably right response to potentially catastrophic human tragedy to a cover for the geopolitical ambitions of individual powers. The next milestone is Libya, UNS, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973, acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, quote, authorises member states that have notified the Secretary General acting nationally or through regional organisations or arrangements and acting in cooperation with the Secretary General to take all <coughs> necessary measures, notwithstanding Paragraph 9 of Resolution 1970, to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack in Libya, including Benghazi, whilst excluding a foreign occupation force of any form on any part of Libyan territory. As I speak, the military intervention in Libya continues. It's very early to assess its success. To me, it appears so far to have satisfied all the tests laid down by the Commission for Military Intervention to protect human life. It raises the very practical issue of whether the intervention will succeed, how do we know it will protect more lives than it costs, what is the exit strategy, all legitimate questions and all questions which ultimately require answers. But it is important for there to be recognition that the humanitarian protection measures will need almost certainly to be accompanied by stabilisation measures, measures which help to produce stable government in Libya. Those measures will be embraced in the phrase all necessary measures in the relevant Security Council resolution. As a matter of practical reality, I have no doubt that as a vital part of the deliberations of the UK War Cabinet, the law officers will be engaged considering all the time whether, for example, arming the rebels, bombing particular targets or other military deployments are, as a matter of good sense, necessary measures to protect civilian and civilian populated areas in Libya. Without stabilisation, there cannot be humanitarian protection. What these measures are, which do not draw the external powers into becoming an additional combatant who make the situation worse, I do not know. But that work needs to be done to identify them and deliver them, I have no doubt. And that they raise difficult questions under, under the reasonable prospects no harm test is not a reason for failing to act. 
I unequivocally support the intervention in Libya, Libya. I support it because on the evidence it is likely to have saved thousands of lives, and I support it because it is a course authorised in accordance with international law. I pay tribute to the work of the United Kingdom Prime Minister in making it happen, and I also pay tribute to the work of the Department of International Development, led by Andrew Mitchell, for the effective way that they have made humanitarian assistance, which is distinct from the military intervention available in Libya, in particular the work they did to assist in the movement of hundreds of thousands of refugees who fled Libya in the face of the uprising. In an intervention such as this, urgent decisions will be required, and so will the need to, keep, to continue to keep under review whether the Commission's principles are satisfied. Subsequent to Libya, in Resolution 1975, the United Nations Security Council, under Chapter 7 of the Charter, have authorised the use of force in the Ivory Coast to protect human life in the conflict there. The risks of a humanitarian disaster in the Ivory Coast are very substantial. What only a decade ago was condemned as unauthorised is now accepted as legitimate, and twice in four weeks the United Nations have authorised it. The history of the last 20 years in international relations has fundamentally changed the international community's view of military intervention for human protection. The conscience-shocking events in Rwanda and Srebrenica have made it impossible for the view to prevail that such intervention is contrary to international law.